cut off the transcript so I don't see myself talking. All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're honored today to have Charles Carroll from Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories here to give our uh, Sizer webinar. And Charles is an engineering manager with SEL's Infrastructure Defense Cyber Services. As a security engineer, Charles and his team design, test, and assess and commission networks and um, cybersecurity solutions for critical infrastructure. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Electronic Engineering and a BS in Cybersecurity. So he's on both sides of the fence. Uh, we talk about uh, power systems engineers and cybersecurity and CS folks, and Charles has both of those covered, as well as numerous industry certifications. And today he's going to talk about purposeful design, defending critical infrastructure. So and we're going to encourage everybody to put their comments in the chat, and we'll handle those at the end. Um, so if you have a certain slide, feel free to put something on that. So Charles. Awesome. Thank you. Happy to be with you all today. Um, yeah, so uh, what I want to talk to you all uh, about today is um, maybe some kind of practical steps that we can take uh, to secure critical infrastructure. Um, people talk about the differences uh, between IT and OT often, uh, and I want to expound on that a little bit. Uh, and see how some of those differences can actually help us uh, when we're talking about critical infrastructure or um, industrial control systems. And some of the things I'm going to mention uh, may seem easy or apparent, and a lot of them are, um, but often, you know, in the name of convenience or, um, you know, not wanting to put in the, the extra legwork, um, they're often neglected. <coughs> neglected. Uh, for instance, uh, recently, I was in Europe and did an assessment on a customer's power system, and they had, you know, state-of-the-art controls on their IT side, uh, with, you know, fully virtualized infrastructure and, you know, all, every imaginable IT service you could uh, <laughs> you could have. But as soon as you cross the firewall onto the OT side or, or operational technology, and I'll, I'll define these terms a little bit more in a minute, um, almost everything was basically in a default configuration. And it should be the exact opposite. Um, a lot of the things that we need in, in, in an information technology kind of centric environment is unnecessary in operational technology environment. So um, we'll, we'll talk about how we can limit or uh, disable some of these uh, things and improve security. So first off, um, you know, assuming we're we're familiar with IT systems, I'll talk, I'm going to kind of define uh, what uh, an industrial control system is. Um, you know, these are systems used for process control. They, uh, they, we also refer to it kind of interchangeably these days as operational technology. Um, but these are systems, the, they use PLCs, RTUs, uh, SCADA, et cetera, and they have a lot of unique protocols. Um, but um, as you can see, they're, they're main, meant to operate critical systems. So tampering uh, with these can, can lead to injury or sickness or even death uh, in, in some cases. Uh, so these are critical, critical systems. And one way you can think about it is that uh, information technology network, uh, they move information or operational technology uh, they use the information. So it's machine to machine making decisions uh, on processes. Um, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the CIA triad. And these, this doesn't really change uh, with these kind of uh, industrial control systems. We're still uh, concerned, you know, with confidentiality, integrity, availability. But what does change is, is, is how they're focused. Um, often you'll hear people talk when, when they're discussing uh, operational technology and they'll say, um, you know, in, in, in OT availability matters and IT confidentiality matters. And that's somewhat true that the OT networks must be highly reliable, uh, but it's more true to say that the system must be built to support the mission of the company. So 
all those functions matter. Um, they just mean different things depending on, on our environment. Um, most of the systems I work on, uh, there's a critical safety aspect. So availability is critical, but it's also critical that the device settings, uh, the, the, the messages within the communication are not tampered with. Uh, so again, the, the distinction is process oriented data, you know, versus PII or credit card information, the kind of things we typically think about on IT systems. Um, and here's some of the, you know, kind of the the normal boiler boilerplate <laughs> differences between IT and OT. Um, talk about uh, uh, you know safety. Talk about the availability, meaning that even you know delays that would be commonly accepted in IT, you know, a, a second delay on on a network might be uh, critical on 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 the OT side. But I think if you look at this slide, the one thing that should be apparent is um, that the OT or control system is is purpose built and static. So we're not looking for a new application to the to be deployed next week, right? We we build these things and we expect them um, to live for for 20 years. Um, so um, that gives us the ability to be purposeful in the controls that that we implement and really limit the system to only what's necessary uh, for the operation of the system. Um, I, I sometimes call this least viable functionality. So we're trying to make the system do the task it's designed for, but it shouldn't really be able to do anything else. Um, <laughs> people often, I, I really like this this slide, so um, people who know me will, will know I reference this a lot, but this is from a white paper that Rob Lee uh, from Dragos put out quite a while back, and he was talking about, um, thinking about the return on investment for security controls. Um, so, you know, with this, he, basically the gist of the paper was saying when evaluating how to design security into a system, you, sh you should consider the where and how and by whom the security controls will be implemented. So, uh, in general, um, there's a cost versus reward uh, in, in terms of security posture. Um, things like a good architecture has very little economic impact, but it provides a lot of benefit to the system security, and then you move to the other side of the scale, you'll see uh, things like offense, um, you know, like hack back, in other words, um, have they, they have very little value uh, in the grand scheme of thing, and even sometimes have ethical or even legal implications. So um, the single most effective thing in terms of security is to implement a well-defined architecture. And architecture is not only the physical topology and segmentation uh, of a network, but also how we uh, design, you know, the the devices that are in that network. Um, and that's kind of what I'm want to get to today is how do we uh, understand the system um, to apply those controls effectively and and minimize uh, our attack surface. And again, these this you know this is benefit versus cost. So these are cost-effective measures that we can use. So um, getting started uh, on, on system hardening, here's an example architecture diagram, and this is always the first step that we use in implementing controls. And it's just understanding what we're building and what communication paths have to exist. Um, you know, often we'll use a reference architecture such as, such as the Purdue model, uh, which is kind of referenced here. Um, but this should go further than just dividing the network into logical segments. Um, you know, we, we implement things at the border like very restrictive firewall rules that um, limit communications from host to host. Uh, but the kind of the point I really want to make here is um, the engineer should understand exactly what is required for system operation and limit the communication and services to this, just those. Um, for instance, in this design, you can see an engineer workstation. Uh, you see, you know, 
operator workstation, you can see servers. Um, and a lot of these are probably uh, Windows-based devices, uh, perhaps, and most of them would require specific software packages and services for their role. Um, and that's really the only thing that they need is those particular softwares to run. But I can almost guarantee you that <laughs> if you actually went into this, uh, most of these networks similar to this, you would find that all this, you know, there's so much extra bloat that's put in. Even embedded versions of Windows have numerous services uh, that aren't required. And one easy one to identify is IPv6, right? So IPv6 is 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 turned on and by default and 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 almost everything, um, but it's never used in in in, in the networks uh, that I work on. So. Um, a lot of legacy devices don't even support it, and even some of the newer stuff, uh, it, it isn't distributed with support for IPv6. So that's an easy hit that we can, uh, you know, something that we can turn off that could possibly provide a pivot point for an attacker. Uh, another thing uh, that 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 I really encourage people to do um, that's not often done is is benchmarking uh, their systems. Um, so benchmarks are guides uh, for implementing best known practices and in, in for securing a system. Um, and when I say system, you know, I, I'm referring primarily to operating systems uh, with this, but there are um, guides such as STIGs and SRGs that provide the same type of guidance for, for network devices. Um, but anyways, so the two most popular I just mentioned were um, what you see on the screen as the Center for Internet Security benchmarks, and then there's also uh, the STIGs and SRGs that are published by DISA. Um, and so to apply these, you know, in a, in a domain environment, you can do them uh, via Active Directory, or you can do them uh, in, in a non-domain joined environment. You can do them uh, locally. Um, Plant them directly in a standalone machine, but these benchmarks are published. Uh, the CIS, uh, in particular, are published in two levels, uh, which is the, the level one, which is good security, ease of use, and then level two, which is considered a high security benchmark, and um, you know, kind of really restricts the op what the operating system can do. And it's interesting that. The level of compliance I can achieve on an industrial control system, uh, say Windows computer, is so much greater with, than what I can achieve in an IT environment. Uh, typically, with uh, in in uh, the ICS world, I can hit a 95% compliance rating, <laughs> and then it, like a default Windows configuration may hit 20%. Uh, it's very rarely do I see a 90 plus compliance uh, level in a in an IT system. Um, and that's, again, because of the dynamic nature of those. You can also do the same thing in Linux. Um, you know, you can use system partitioning, changing file ownership, uh, PAM modules, that type of stuff. Um, and we do some Linux too, but I see a lot more Windows use. Uh, and then probably the one of the most beneficial things that you can do uh, in a static control system environment is allow listing. Um, so with allow listing, I explicitly tell the machine what can run and nothing else can run. And this is a lot different than traditional um, anti-malware where either you know a string or a behavior is blocked. In allow listing, everything is blocked except what you have permitted. And again, this goes back to the point um, this is much easier to implement in, in the systems I work on than in an IT uh, environment. Uh, most, a lot of the IT security practitioners will say, oh, this is a very hard control to manage. But in, a, in an OT environment, we install what is required from a software perspective. And this should never really change. Like we know what, need, you know, what job the computer needs to do and we lock it down. Um, so there should be very little interaction beyond the initial um, initial configuration. And some examples on there, uh, just just uh, I guess the, the the 
the green lock uh, is app locker, which uh, is included with Windows. So uh, there's a opportunity to, to use that. Uh, McAfee is a third party application. And then ExaGuard is, is, uh, is the whitelisting that we include in, in our SEL devices, like the RTAC and the 3620. Um, um, so here I have a screenshot from a, an assessment I really uh, recently did um, and just kind of pointing to, to, to how a network might look in its default configuration um, and and again these are things that you know aren't aren't necessary right from a confidentiality standpoint um, the top left you can see a Cisco device uh, that was uh, leaking subnet information or leaking network information between subnets because CDP was enabled um, you can also see uh, IPv6 and uh, link local multicast name resolution on on the middle shot there, which um, completely unnecessary in the network. LLM, LLMNR uh, has many well-documented vulnerabilities uh, and exploits that you can use. Um, and you can also reference STIG or, or SR, SRGs for guidance on on recommended configurations for most network devices, and then also I wanted to just you know pointing back to to the unique protocols and some of the design considerations uh, that should be taken into place or taken uh, into account when um, you know configuring your settings for these networks. The last kind of Wireshark capture there is a misconfiguration of uh, the protection network that's using. Uh, IEC 61850, or you might know it as Goose, and it's not being implemented per the standard. So all the Goose traffic, which is uh, a layer two multicast protocol, is all on the default VLAN, which means that it can just go everywhere. So uh, a lot of unneeded network congestion, and then no prioritization of you know those time critical protection messages. So. Uh, I am an SEL employee, so I want to mention one of our pieces of technology. Uh, this is one of the something I work with a lot, and I think uh, it really does help uh, simplify our, our networks. And when I say simplify, I don't mean from a um, kind of a connection-oriented, you know, plug-and-play uh, perspective, but um, you know, like traditional SDN uh, control plane is abstracted from the data plane, so we have you know, very, we had the ability to be very specific in, 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 in what we allow on our network. So even if we've not configured a lot of the stuff on, on the, you know, the IPv6 and those type of things, like I mentioned, it won't pass in this switch. We have to be uh, incredibly, incredibly specific with, and understand what the host to host communication looks like. So we deterministically design the network and move traffic between endpoints. And we can also fail over uh, uh, very quickly uh, between between endpoints if we need to. So I think this is is a way that uh, from a, a operational technology standpoint, we've kind of improved um, how the networks will perform while also in, uh, improving the security and then we're also, in a side note, we're also um, making the engineer understand the network the way it should be understood. Um, and what I mean is, uh, I was in a um, uh, one of the intrusion analyst classes that I was in, and Dave Holzer spoke about, you know, if if you can't do a packet capture on your network and identify every packet on there, then then you're not doing your due diligence as far as, as, as security goes. And I, and I agree with them. And with this approach, um, you, you're required to do that. So, you know, we, we define everything. Uh, we know exactly which host can ARP another host. So we, we, we kind of shrink that broadcast domain down uh, to host to host and really have a good understanding of, of what, 
communications are in our network and can prioritize critical communications easily. And this, and, and this kind of diagrams, uh, these data flow diagrams also, um, they're a requirement for, for many uh, security frameworks. Um, I think of the NIST cybersecurity framework and also uh, the Center for Internet Security, the CCSC, their, their framework, they all um, require these diagrams. So, uh, kind of wrap this up. Um, <laughs> It will com complexity decreases security. So if we have all these protocols that we don't need, that added complexity, added pathways, um, they really do um, kind of open us up uh, from a security perspective. So if we don't need something, um, we should turn it off. Um, but the one thing that, that we do need to remember is that this kind of um, this kind of approach does take some work. So uh, it takes someone who is willing to spend the time to understand uh, these systems and and to do the, their due, due diligence and testing um, the controls that they've put in place. But again, it's, it, it has a really big payoff as far as, um, you know, implementing security without, you know, we're, we haven't added any devices, right? We're just using correct settings and best known methods uh, to, to add, um, to really improve our security posture. So with that, uh, kind of wraps, wraps up what I had. Okay, thanks Charles. So uh, one, before we get into the technical ideas, our technical questions. I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about uh, the opportunities you think there are for careers in the in the cyberspace, and you know what yeah. are some things that you look for in employees that you're trying to get in this space. Okay, yeah. So I did put a little. I did put one slide in here so we can uh, show show that kind of what what my guys do. Um, so. Um, we are on the services side of SEL, and um, my guys are our titles are project engineer security. Um, so we design, build, and test these systems. A lot of the stuff I've talked about today are are the work that we do. So we take the time to understand the systems. We work with our automation and protection guys to understand um, what controls are critical to prioritize those controls, and we also test the systems. Uh, to evaluate, you know, do they function the way that that, that we've said they would function? Um, but other than that, we also work uh, a lot in, um, for instance, in Europe, uh, where SEL has a smaller presence. Uh, often, we'll be called in to uh, look at the work of other people. So, doing assessments, um, we do a lot of we do some of those uh, assessments for the government also uh, and some of their systems. So um, really, I guess the thing I like to tell people about uh, working in security uh, as a project engineer is we get to touch so many aspects of the system, which is not typical in most security roles. Um, most security guys I know on the IT side of the house, they're usually relegated to, you know, this is a Splunk guy, this is that guy, this guy does, the, I, I do it all, and that's one of the things I love about uh, my job is I get to have a holistic view of the system. We're constantly learning, um, so um, yeah. And and again, we get to go interesting places and see the sides of you know the insides of substations in other countries. That it's not something that everybody gets to see, so uh, it's exciting in in that regard also. And I think Charles, you and I were talking a little bit before we got started um, about kind of how um, in your in your uh, position you you get to see a lot of different um, get to go a lot of different places. It's, you mentioned Europe a couple times in your talk, mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit more about as we look at the OT and you you started that conversation? 
you know, basically this, there are opportunities worldwide related to both with companies like SEL, US based companies, but just in general, what you see related to opportunities worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really is a world, a worldwide effort. Um, um, like I said, my group supports pretty much everywhere, but um, you know, other companies also, uh, um, there's similar roles, um, you know, in, in countries where SEL is not, uh, not, not, not as big of a name, but um, again, it, it, in Europe, uh, you know, Siemens and ABB are really bigger, big players. Um, and I've, you know, we, we have several different projects where we've went and audited the work that they've done. Um, so uh, we, we do a lot of work in the Middle East, uh, supporting uh, oil and gas industries. Um, so yeah, it really, it really is, um, really is worldwide. And and this field, uh, one thing I will mention, uh, if anyone is interested in it, this, you know, the the kind of, I guess, if you go back to my presentation, the things that I'm mentioning, a lot of the, a lot of the reason that these aren't applied in systems is because they don't have that person who is a, the security expert who does understand what the system's supposed to do at the same time. And that's really, you know, I guess one of, another one of the big um, reasons why I'm so passionate about this is because it's not always that hard. Like a lot of times it just takes someone to understand, okay, this is what we need from a, um, you know, uh, what the system's primary function is. And then this is what I can do to secure the system. And really working together to to come up with a you know a solution that's uh, robust that does what it's supposed to do but is secure at the same time. So. Asifa, you have a question? Yes, I do. <clears throat> Thanks, Charles, for an interesting uh, presentation and coming ready with a slide for a yeah. question that could come your way. And so it was a perfect fit for that. And while this slide is up, I, I I'm going to ask you a question about systems. And I remember in your presentation you had uh, talked about you know things that would be on Windows and Linux operating systems and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so we generally have an idea about the systems from you know day to day kind of things. But when it comes specifically to infrastructures uh, from your industry, how do you compare you know these systems against one another in terms of both vulnerabilities and the kind of defense that you would do about them. Just some general things that you see uh, in contrast between these two. Um, yeah, so one of the biggest contrasts between like the, the systems that 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 you would interact with daily versus what we might see is, um, I guess first would be uh, the presence of legacy devices. So um, a lot of our challenges is that these systems do operate for 20 years. So when Windows doesn't support a certain operating system anymore, you know, we have to come up with alternate mitigations to kind of protect those devices um, without, you know, maybe the, the, the patching that is typically done. Um, so we, we do have a lot of focus in, in segmentation and, and kind of walling off, um, you know, protected enclaves, if you will, the, uh, you know, so to kind of wall off that vulnerability uh, until you know a new a new uh, system can be designed. The other thing that's really unique is protocols, and I think that's um, I love networking, so uh, <laughs> we uh, there's a all kinds of unique protocols that are used in in, in industrial control systems. So um, and a DMP3, um, probably the old one that everybody's heard of is Modbus, but um, you know, there's also um, like IEC 104, which is used in Europe mostly. Uh, so, you you know, we're always interacting with, with something different. Uh, I think I mentioned Goose during my presentation. It's a unique uh, layer two multicast protocol that, um, you know, has some very specific guidelines on, on, on how uh, it should be implemented. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of unique aspects. And, and again, that's one of the things why you, you know, it, it's kind of a really nuanced field a lot of times. People tend to get in this, uh, you know, go down this trail as it were, and then you kind of become 
some somewhat of a of of of, a, of an expert on a on a very nuanced field that not a lot of people do, uh, deal in. So uh, mm-hmm. it, it's a lot of fun. Right. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have another question from Hyping about um, was the network hardening done at once on the hardware side or on the fly for the network traffic? Yeah, so uh, typically the way we execute projects is we identify everything up front. So the idea is that we harden the system uh, prior to uh, our internal testing. Um, So that way we can, uh, you know, prove that the controls I've put in place haven't affected system functions that maybe the protection engineers or the automation engineers have put in place. So, uh, again, you know, it's a good point (laughs) that he's making. Like, we need to make, you know, this stuff is not things that you can do on the fly and and just, um, you know, expect it to work. It does take a lot of testing. There is a lot of work that goes into identifying what, um, what we can do and then testing to make sure it did not, there was no adverse effects uh, to, to anything else. So, Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Noah. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this presentation. It was very pleasant. Uh, I certainly enjoyed it. Uh, I know that a lot of people spend most of their time focusing on the cyber aspect and that threat is real. Um, I mean, we're, we're living in the age of cyber warfare, so that's absolutely, um, it's absolutely necessary. But um, no, I see the, I see the firewall there, but then I, I started thinking my, um, there's, you know, in, in this case, in this particular case, it's a, I'm going to use like a water district and I have, I have friends who work there, friends and family that work there and uh, they can have the best firewalls in the world, but um you know, a pair of bolt cutters and a stick drive can really get to that OT. And I know that you said that um, the, and, and I guess it's like, you got to look at the security big picture, but I, do you guys do, uh, do you guys do like overview on physical security as well? Yeah. So um, my group does not really focus on physical security, but you are absolutely correct in, in, in what you're saying. So, you know, I guess I'll go back to a recent assessment um, and, and kind of um, the one that I mentioned in here about, you know, the state of the art IT systems protecting remote access. But what I am concerned with is that local connection. So, um, you know, if you have uh, bolt cutters and a USB drive, um, you can get in there and if you start smashing stuff, yes, you can definitely affect the system. But what I don't want to do is is have um, you know long term access where they can you know make changes. And again, these systems uh, from a protection and automation side are designed very robustly that they'll react to, to even that kind of local, um, I guess uh, you know damage, right? Like someone with a sledgehammer. Um, mm-hmm. You, it's. It's uh, but physical security is always, and if you look at you know the the NERC SIP regulations, the NRC regulations in the U.S., that's definitely part of the big picture. So, yeah, your your point is very valid. <laughs> but that's not that's not something I typically work in much. Mm-hmm. Okay, Charles, I had a, a, a couple a uh, couple questions that I had if someone else didn't have questions. So um, one of the things you mentioned about working with multiple, um, that in some of the OT systems, there can be multiple different um, vendors that are part of that process. So yes. as we look at cybersecurity, how do you as vendor one, you know, work related to interacting with vendor two and kind of a follow up on that. Are the standards getting more mature in the OT environment such that we can have the plug and play or do we still have challenges related to that as we look at cybersecurity? Yeah, 
So um, the vendor interop interop you know operability question, I guess, is that kind of depends from from at least from my perspective from project to project. So I do work in a lot where I'm you know a subcontractor to a contractor, uh, but usually um, that's that's why the process of documentation of reviews that's why it exists um uh SEL in particular is very um focused on 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 well documenting a system and, and what we're trying to do so um typically that's how we make sure that everybody is working well together is 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 you know by having it well documented and and distributed around um from the plug and play perspective, um, I would say that you know the the previous question about physical security uh, it, it kind of kind of relates back to that, right? We can't, you know, in my mind, we can't really have plug and play because you know the, you don't know what you don't know. So something that's you know, if we implement all the security controls we can today, um, we don't know the vulnerability that might be discovered tomorrow. So that's why we try to limit as much as we can uh, to kind of give that defense in depth or, or, or at least, you know, zero trust, least trust kind of posture. Um, so we are kind of insulating ourselves against what might be discovered, you know, the next log 4J that affects everybody. So. <laughs> Okay, well, I think I have to ask this question, but how do you see in the events of the last week and a half, how do you see uh, OT cybersecurity as an important part of, as we start to talk about um, different conflicts that may be between different countries and in general? Right. So I think, I think the, you know, it, it is very telling. I mean, Russia has attacked Ukraine several times with cyber um you know uh, the last time was very they came very close to causing uh i think what they did is they loaded relay protection settings in backwards so the ip address got messed up um which if 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 they had been successful they would have had a relay on a power system with no protection setting so we had a really there's a really real possibility that someone could have been killed from that attack had had it been successful. Um, and these kind of attacks aren't necessarily, you know, going to 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 overthrow, um, not necessarily overthrow a government, but they do instill a lot of fear. They can they can cost lives, um, and and they have pretty pretty, you know, far-reaching uh, consequences. So. And and they can set. I mean, you can set. You know, if the attack is has enough impact, you could possibly set. You know, progress back. Right. Uh, you look at what happened in Iran with Stux, Stuxnet. You know, they lost the. Uh, a, a, you know, an entire uh, nuclear facility because of the damage that was done. Um, so yeah, these threats are real. Um, they're only going to get worse, and and that's why. You know, when we're working to secure these systems, it's not you know it's it's not a script kitty with that's that's playing around at home in the evening. You know, these are nation state actors uh, that have resources, uh, deep pockets, and you know we need to it's it's serious work, <laughs> and we need to take it seriously. So. Any other questions? Anybody wants to unmute and ask a question? All right, I'll keep asking then. So Charles, you have an electrical engineering or electronics engineering degree Correct. and a cybersecurity degree. And Correct. you mentioned earlier about one of the challenges in the OT environment of security in the OT environment was understanding kind of the critical infrastructure, how it works with the security aspects of that. Yes. So can you speak a little bit to how you found, um, you know, you have two degrees, but how you think 
as a student, what they should be thinking about if they're in computer science, cybersecurity, you know, what should they be thinking about double E and if they're in power and they're interested in cybersecurity, can you talk a little bit about that bridge and how you see, how important you see that being? Right. So yeah, I started off in electronics engineering. I did um, some small amount of process control, uh, mainly in the mining industry, a lot of communication and safety system based stuff. But when I first started working in it, uh, we worked primarily in, in serial comms. So there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of concern with, with cyber, but as we, you know, as I worked throughout the years, you know, we started getting more and more ethernet connectivity, more things started becoming internet connected. And, and I realized I didn't understand enough. I felt like, I'm not sure that this is a good idea. What, you know, how, how this system's being hooked up. Um, so, um, that I did, um, you know, I, I dabbled in, in IT stuff uh, on a personal level, but I decided to go back to school and get another bachelor's degree in, in, in security uh, just because, because I felt like I had a lack of understanding. But uh, while I was in school, um, a friend of mine uh, who at the time was, uh, he, uh, he was, I forget, he like the VP of security at Bank of America or somewhere, and I asked him, um, you know, if he had any pointers, and he's like, well, what did you do before you got into security? And I was like, well, I did, you know, some automation and process of control and that type of thing. And he's like, well, you should find a way to, um, you know, follow your new, your new dream with stuff that you already uh, were, were, were interested in. And I kind of took that to heart and, and it, and it turned out to be true, right? Like, being able to understand, you know, basic protection, automation uh, type projects, uh, and then leveraging, you know, the the, the IT expertise that that I that I that I gained really helped. And you know, uh, in a lot of these projects, that's sometimes my main role. You know, <laughs> if we're integrating, uh, say, um, you know, some sort of um, new microgrid control system with a bunch of distributed energy resources into a university. A lot of times we have to we have to interact with the university personnel, and and these are enterprise level IT systems, right? So um, having someone who can understand the needs from an automation or protection standpoint, and who can communicate that effectively back to the IT crowd and vice versa uh, is very helpful. So. Um, I guess you know, that's a long way to say. I'll, I'll, I'll say the same thing I tell my guys because I do hire a lot of guys who come from IT backgrounds. But I'll tell them to you know to pay attention. Like if you're in this role, like just because it's not your job focus doesn't mean you shouldn't try to understand um, what's happening. So understanding the system as a whole is is, is critical. Um, but you know that that is some of the uh, uh, the nuance of, of this type of role. It does require you to really um, kind of dig in. So I'm always learning something. <laughs> well, I think I think your example just really talks about how a lot of the important challenges today are on the edges of traditional fields, and Correct. that those those folks that get some you know, may not get a ne necessarily a second degree, but a certificate, taking a couple electives in an area, that's going to give you um, a leg up to be able to speak the language of somebody, whether Absolutely. it's an IT, IT person in a, in a power application or a power person in a security application, that by having some of those backgrounds, you can speak the language and, and be a bridge to some of those activities that may give you some career opportunities that are a little bit different. Right. Um, but it does get you a little bit out of your comfort zone. And I think for you to acknowledge that you felt you were, uh, you know, technically you felt you were very shallow from your previous background. So you went and got another degree, whether it's another bachelor's degree, whether it's a certificate, whether it's a master's degree, you know, those are opportunities as we look upon these edge these edge challenges where, it, you know, it's not 
just one field or the other. It's really important. Right. All right, do we have any other questions from folks on? I just want to thank you for coming today. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, Charles. We appreciate you being part of our Sizer, uh, Sizer seminar series and uh, providing the the connection to the OT and, and some of your different talks and things like that. So uh, as we discussed earlier, it's, uh, it's the East Coast for Charles, so we especially appreciate him staying after hours, although he says he works on all different time zones. Yeah. So, <laughs> so thank you, Charles, and uh, we we look forward to uh, having other interactions with SEL moving forward. Oh. Thank you. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Good evening.